so excited to dive into our topic. Topic is leading adoption in a change environment. We're here today with some great guests. We're essentially preparing and getting excited and, and leading up to our upcoming executive symposium in Houston on the topic, leading adoption in a change environment on October 26th from, uh, in, from 5 to 8 p.m. If you are interested in learning about this topic, if you're interested in meeting with other executives, if you're interested in learning new ways to handle leadership challenges and connecting with other executives that can relate to your challenges, come to the event. I'll put the link to RSVP in the chat. But today we've got three incredible guests that will also be at our executive symposium on October 26th. Um, we've got Christine, we've got Jack, and we've got Matt. Thank you all for being here. Matt, do you mind just introducing yourself? Yeah, for sure. My name is Matt Harriman, and I'm the founder of, of Pod2, which is a uh, management consulting, leadership development, and tech company. Um, we specialize a lot in, in oil and gas and, and energy, um, especially around planning, decision-making, uh, and strategy. Very cool. Jack, how about yourself? Yeah, my name is Jack Whelan, the Director of Business Development for International Accelerator, which is kind of a hybrid accelerator slash VC fund. Um, focused exclusively on partnering with foreign-born founders, helping them with everything from immigration through ideally their Series A fundraising. Um, but being business development, obviously my role entails making sure we're bringing in new investment opportunities, new companies to the accelerator, but also working within each individual portfolio companies or company on their individual business development efforts. Very cool. And then Christine, how about yourself? Uh-oh. I think we might have lost Christine briefly, but hope she'll be back soon. Um, and one thing I didn't uh, introduce was myself. I'm Garrett Mintz. I'm the founder of Ambition in Motion. We are the people, we're the organization putting on the upcoming executive symposium. And at Ambition in Motion, our vision is a world where the vast majority of people are excited to go to work. When they are there, their expectations meet reality. And when they come home, they feel fulfilled. And everything we do works toward that outcome. And we believe it starts with leaders. We believe leaders create the experiences employees have while at work. And so we create technologies and communities to empower leaders to be the best selves for their teams. So hopefully Christine will be able to join us in just a moment, but let's just dive into the topic. Topic is leading adoption in a change environment. And so, you know, Matt, Jack, and when Christine gets back, Christine, what have, I guess, when companies need to pivot, what is typically the decision-making process around that pivot? Why are those pivots determined necessary for the business to thrive and move forward? And then what are some of the hurdles for getting team members that you've typically seen on board with some of these new changes and initiatives? And if there is resistance, why is there typically resistance? Hmm. Yeah, I, I can I can lead that one off. Um, I, I think that companies will pivot in, in one of two scenarios. One is when things are really bad. Um, and they have to in order to to survive. So very reactionary. Um, and then the other is is when the leadership team does does a good job of reevaluating strategy kind of consistently, and maybe they identify that there's there's something coming down down the pipe in the future or or some other you know variable to the business. Maybe they want something different out of the business, and and so they're going to take it into a different direction. So it's a little more proactive or, or intentional. Um, and I, I think there's, there's a whole host of, of complications that can come up when, when you're trying to make a pivot, trying to make a change. Um, but to me, it's one of these things that is actually extremely simple, uh, but very, very hard. So, so I, I think it, it starts with creating, creating a vision for, for where you're trying to go. Um, I like starting with purpose and saying, you know, what's the, why are we trying to make some change? Um, and then describing that change and that future state that's, that's different from today in, in enough detail to make it actionable. Um, I think one reason that a lot of people don't get on board is because they don't actually fully understand what they're getting on board for or where, where leadership is trying to take them. Um, but once you've got, you know, a clearly defined, articulated vision that's been well communicated, then at that point, it's behavior change, which is hard um, and it's very individualized. And, you know, we, we can come back to, you know, motivations and influences and, and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, breaking it down to those simpler pieces of, you know, why are we trying to change? What are we trying to do? And then, you know, 
getting into the the blocking and tackling of of helping people get there. Yeah, Matt, thanks for sharing that. I think that makes a ton of sense. Christine, welcome back. So, Thank you. Yeah, Sorry for that. No worries. Christine, if you could just briefly introduce yourself and then I'll recap Matt's answer to the quest, first question I had. But yeah, Christine, tell us who you are and um, just a little bit of your, back, of your background. Oh, thank you. So Christine Gay, I'm an educator and a revenue leader. I've spent all my time, my career in education in the K-12 space and I've done everything in the school district from being a classroom teacher to interim superintendent and then outside working with educators from the outside with educational companies to support, to support educators. Awesome, thanks for sharing that, Christine. So the first question I asked was, what, what have you found to be the reason for why organizations need to make a pivot? And when they make a pivot, why did those pivots need to happen? And how, you know, what have you found to be effective for communicating that the need for the pivot across an organization? And why is there sometimes backlash for that? And so, so one of the things Matt talked about was just conveying the purpose of change and why that's necessary. And sometimes it can be difficult. Sometimes it can be hard, but conveying that purpose of change can be, be really critical um, to the adoption of why the change is necessary. But I'm going to, I've got some follow-up questions on that, but Jack and Christine, I'd love to learn why do companies typically need to make pivots in your perspective and what is typically backlash they receive both verbally to their face and as well as with their actions? Because sometimes we'll see a pivot happen and the CEO or the leader will say, yeah, we're going to we're going to pivot in this direction. Everyone's like, yeah, we're on board. Sounds great. We're in. And then you're like, hold on a second. You look at the work three weeks later. You're like, you're still doing it the old way. What is going on? And they're like, oh, I'm on board. I'm on board. And they're secretly not on board or they don't fully understand it. Um, so what are some of the yeah, hurdles or trials, tribulations that come with making a pivot? And, and why do companies make those pivots? And I'll jump in, Christine, if you don't mind, since I've had a little longer to think about it. But, you know, echoing Matt here, why do companies pivot? I think the more mature you are, yes, things could be going very bad. So you need to pivot. You don't really have another option. Um, also for more mature companies, it could just be diversification of revenue streams, you know, setting yourself up to be more protected in the future. Or in my world, you know, working with startups, things aren't bad. There's just not things. So, you know, you're not generating that initial revenue stream. Um, so need to kind of rethink the business model, rethink you know, your service offerings, maybe which customers you're going after. And to your point of, yes, when the CEO is giving that message, everybody's lip service and yeah, it's perfect, it's perfect. But I think the hurdles you get, backlash, resistance to change, often stem from a lack of transparency about, you know, why are we making this change? And I think, especially small, medium-sized organizations, oftentimes certain things are kept under wraps, like you know, company financials. For a lot of private companies, your average, um, average Joe, has no idea what the profit margin was last month compared to this month. Um, and I think this is a polarizing topic because as a business leader, you would hate to show the whole company, oh, we lost money this month. Um, but I've worked for private, public, you know, large and very small companies. And one of the private companies I worked with, we reviewed financials down to the branch level um, for every branch in the state and every single employee knew yeah, we lost money last week. Uh, or last month, excuse me, you know, here's the steps that we're going to take to make sure that we do make a profit next month. Um, so I think giving that full business picture of why whatever we're changing is being changed, what it means to us. Yes, is it scary as an employee to hear like the organization that pays my mortgage and my grocery bills, you know, lost money last month. Um, but I think for me, at least it does one, it's a matter of respect from leadership down to the employees that they're including you in that holistic decision-making process. Um, two, it just gives you the clear picture. And I think the motivation of like, yes, this is a change that we need to make and we need to execute on because, you know, we can lose money this month. We can't lose money for the next six months. Otherwise, you know, there's going to be some more meaningful changes around <laughs> in the terms of headcount. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And Christine, how about you? Why do companies make pivots? And what are some of the uh, backlash or issues that come with making some of those changes? Yes, uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is something that we all uh, encountered 
uh, which is the, the, the pandemic. Things like those that are out of control for any organization, for anyone, are things that will make organizations have to pivot. A lot of organizations that were not able to do business remotely had to find a way of doing that, including our own schools. So when things like those happen, it is something that leadership has to really think about quickly and be able to pivot quickly. However, in that pivoting, there are things that uh, the leadership has to really think about. And one of them is a clear roadmap. Yes, you're telling the organization that we are trying to change, but do you have a well-defined roadmap for the change process? And have you broken it down into manageable phases of that pivot? How are we going to do it? What, what are the timelines? And then on top of that, how are you communicating? What is the feedback loop? That communication is not just one uh, town hall meeting. That communication is not just one email. That communication is, you, we have to think about various ways and do them once, twice, three times, because in your organization, you have a diverse uh, population of people. There are people that are very quick on Slack. Others are very quick on email. Others are better on one-on-one. -on -one. Others are better on, okay, let's have a face and to face or whichever way. So the way we communicate, that roadmap and the process that we are going to be uh, using in order to achieve the, the vision that we are building, that communication loop has to be very clear and has to be continuous. It's a continuous loop. It's not a one time and done. Mm, I love that. I love that you brought that up, Christine, because I think that's a really critical element that a lot of founders and CEOs overlook. Like I know being a visionary, I am not as detail oriented as I would like to be. And so when it comes to pivots, it's easy for me to say, all right, we're not going in this direction anymore. We're going in the direction, heave ho, let's roll. And I recognize, and, and I think there's a lot of CEOs and, and executives out there who are similar, where they're like vision, I see the vision, we're going to change our strategy, we're going to go in this direction, but they don't think about the bite-sized phases as to phase one is going to look like this. Phase two is going to look like this. Phase three is going to look like this. And if we don't have phases, we are much more likely to fail because we are not going to know when the train went off the tracks. If like if zero to 100, if 100 is the next phase, it's not likely we're going to get to 100. But if it's like zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, so on and so forth, we can notice if a, if a train gets off the track. So you know, Matt, Jack, Christine, why do leaders sometimes struggle to create those phases and properly assess whether or not they're still on track towards that inevitable pivot or the pivot as it's going on? I can jump in on this. I think when you are in a leadership role, it's easy to think of step one and 100, um, but there are a lot of different functional groups that you might oversee. They could be working in systems that you don't even have a username and password to access. So some of it is just a lack of visibility into the true day-to-day -day, um, of the different functional teams. And I think, you know, a tool you can use to navigate that is including a broader team, maybe your middle management team in that decision-making process, um, or at least in kind of coming up with that project management style of mapping out that change and what the different steps are um, so that you can kind of take their feedback because, you know, maybe they're not the boots on the ground, but they're certainly closer to the boots on the ground and can kind of, you know, role reverse and coach you through some of the different parts that are going to be important to their individual function, uh, making that change. Whereas, you know, from a CEO's perspective, we need to change from this service to this service. Boom, it's done tomorrow. Often not that simple, but easy to kind of be sitting at the top and, and assume that it'll be a quick little pivot like that. Yeah, and I'll yeah. jump in here. I think one of the other things to me in my in my opinion is leadership alignment. You see, as a CEO, you're a CEO, yes, but you have a lot of other functions within your organization. So if you're not aligned with the marketing person, you're not aligned with the salesperson, you're not aligned with HR, uh, until you bring them on board first so that you're one team before you even disseminate the information to the rest of the employees, that's where the train starts to leave the tracks. Leadership alignment. you got to align with your top leadership first before the whole organization can 
get to understand the vision and where you're going and why the reason of the pivot. So if the, the, the top leadership is struggling, then the whole organization is going to struggle. Yeah, and I, I, I think that alignment point really has to start with that vision of where you're trying to go, right? You, you may draft the, the initial cut of what the vision is and where you're trying to go alone, but then expanding that to the leadership group and then expanding that and letting, you know, middle management and other employees, you know, suggest edits and say, hey, maybe we don't want to look like this. What about this? And like letting that vision evolve over time. And then as far as a roadmap goes, so I've worked, you know, specifically in planning for about 15 years now. And I think there's two parts to, you know, having a plan that are that really, really matter are the end point and the next step. Um, I think in between, you know, the next step and, you know, steps two through a hundred, there's so much uncertainty and you learn so much that I wouldn't want anybody to hear, you know, I need a roadmap and put together a, a Microsoft project um, with 9,000 tasks that leads them to this company pivot. Um, I think having the big chunks, the big phases, like you, like you said, Christine is, is great, but I wouldn't want people to try to, you know, manufacture accuracy and granularity when it's just impossible. Mm, I love that. It's, it makes me think of like the OKR model, which is like, Hey, our objective is to get to this outcome. I think a key result to getting this outcome is a, B and C. No, we're good. It's a hypothesis. We're going to experiment. We may determine A is not working, but B and C is working. And so we're going to keep on with B and C, but not A. And if everyone gets so caught up with, well, you said A, B and C would get us to the promised land. It's like, well, hold on a second. It was a hypothesis. We experimented. Yeah. A didn't work. Got to drop it. We're going to run with B and C now. Yeah. And I think all of this promotes a a culture of adaptability and, and people helping your people be on be comfortable with uncertainty and, and change. I think, I think that sets you up for, you know, success during, you know, call it this pivot and the next one and, you know, whatever else comes along. I think one thing that you, oh yeah, Christine, jump in. I yes. Uh, you know, th that takes me to the time of being a classroom teacher, at, you know, where you have all these curriculums that have been set by you, by McGraw-Hill or Pearson, and now the teacher has to use it in the classroom. And it is, um, it is almost like a cookie cutter kind of way uh, curriculum, but they are teachers. So one, it takes away innovation from innovative teachers because mm -hmm. you're telling them to do it as a certain way in a certain sequence uh, for a certain number of weeks, you know, all that. However, there are teachers that need that because they need the structure. So you have to think about the new teachers. You have to think about teachers that are alternatively certified that actually never went to school to be teachers, but have come here uh, and they want to, to learn and they want, I mean, they want to teach because they want to have their kids learning, but they want someone to give them the guidance of how to do. So both things, you as a leader, you've got to think about those. There are other innovative crew that you have within your organization that, you know, what they, do, they, they, they will think out of the box. In fact, they don't need a box, just crush the box. We don't need a box, but there are others that need the box to be contained and to be given the structure. So you've got to think about the whole picture and who you have in your organization because it's not a one size fits all. Yeah, mm. Great point. That's interesting, Christine. It seems like it sounds like almost like uh, the difference between baking and cooking. It's like mm -hmm. baking precise. I can't just throw a little extra sugar, a little extra flour, and my muffins are going to turn out good. It, you have to be exactly precise. You need a three quarter cup of flour and a you know you know teaspoon of sugar, whatever it is. But uh, bake or cooking, you know, you can be a little more freehand. You can be like, oh, I'm gonna throw this teriyaki sauce in here. Oh, I'm gonna throw a little bit of this or that, and it can still turn out really good and flavorful and be innovative because you have the expertise and experiences in that. So I don't know, that's a weird analogy for, it seems like what you're describing. Jack, you brought up this concept of financials being clear and clarity of financials. I'd be curious to know, Matt, Jack, Christine, where do you sit on this topic of financial transparency from the organization? Um, I'll kind of continue my thought there because that was a private company, the one that I was referencing, and it was a huge company, very successful. One month we'd make money, the next month we'd lose money. The end of the year, hopefully we made money, right? Um, I just believe it, it should be transparent in every organization. And I would 
yeah, I've worked for places where it's not transparent or you get a brief little glimpse, glimpse of it at the annual meeting and it's, oh, wait, I didn't get a screenshot, right? And of course they don't want you screenshotting it. Um, but especially if you're working for a privately held company and you're looking at all the people in the world that work for publicly held companies where they get that update quarterly, annually, whether they're actually looking into it, um, that always felt unfair to me for the employees working for a private company. And again, just goes back to a little bit of um, you know, almost disrespect from leadership from the employee's perspective that you know, you're smart enough to be here and be our salesperson or our accountant, but well, the accountant probably knows, but you know, we're not going to share the whole picture for you. And I think it's a matter of you know, fairness, just doing right by the employee for them to know kind of where the company stands. Um, and also to kind of drive some of the stuff we're talking about change. If you know the company's losing a little bit of money or your margins are shrinking, you're going to be more motivated to participate and be a champion of any changes that are meaningful for you know, top or bottom line. Matt and Christine, what are your thoughts on financial transparency through an organization? I, I think that's a no brainer. I think every organization should be transparent with their finances because one, it helps with motivation because and, and, and um, employees will be motivated to make sure that they don't go down the drain. If we know that we are bleeding and I am very committed to this organization, I will do everything as an employee to make sure that we do not go down the drain or we are not firing people in the next one, two or months. And that's what happens a lot of times when you hear that organizations are firing people or people have to be laid off. It's because there hasn't been enough communication of what's happening with the finances. And now suddenly, you know, we, we, we are looking at having to let some people go very soon. And this is something if they were transparent or um, employees would have been ready to help or they would have prepared themselves well enough to leave the organization uh, in, in, in good time instead of just being told, okay, we, we, we are closing ship today. We, we can't continue because we can't meet salaries or we can't meet this or we are seeing this. So for me, it is, it's actually one of the things that every organization should strive to do. Just be transparent about what's happening because it can't hurt you. It can only help you because employees will gun together to make sure that they stay because no employee wants their company to collapse no matter what. They want the company to be strong. They want the company to continue flourishing financially. And so for them, if they don't know, what are they gonna, how are they gonna help if they don't know? So in, important for transparency. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jump in. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Garrett. I was going to say, Christine, you bring up this really interesting dichotomy of like, you know, the differences between what Jack and you are describing are very interesting because the reason why companies are not transparent about their financials are almost for the exact reason why you brought up was if they think you're going to see these financials, be fearful and then preemptively quit or look for another job because they think they're not a part of the future plans of the organizations while not knowing the CEO or the business leader strategy moving forward, that could create even greater detriment to the organization. Because, you know, let's say as a, that may, as a CEO, they might think, okay, I really see a future with this organization or this department. We may end up having to, to cut this department over here, but if I'm in the the priority department, but I don't know that that's the future plan of the organization, but I can see all the financials. I might be like, all right, I might want to start working my way out of here because this, you know, seems like this is a sinking ship or I might not be around here long enough. So that's a, that's a really interesting, like that's, I would imagine the reason why CEOs aren't always transparent about financials is for that exact purpose. Hmm. I, I think it, all of that comes back to the relationship and the culture within the company of, of trust and, and honesty. And, and, and I think, you know, I, I agree with, with Christine and Jack around, you know, hundred percent transparency into financials, you know, including compensation, including details on that. I think the, the benefits of, you know, avoiding pay discrimination and all of the things that come from um, being transparent about that are, it's a no brainer to me. Um, but going back to kind of our, our topic uh, around leading change, um, you know, John Cotter, one of the you know godfathers of change management and all this stuff, he, one, he says that one of the biggest you know reasons for um, 
change management or change changes to fail is leadership happy talk. So acting like things aren't as bad as they actually are and not being honest about, you know, if we had a, if we lost last month or, you know, what the actual problems are because you're eliciting fear, you know, if, if you're making a big change, there's a good reason for it. And so I know, especially, you know, our, our parents generation, you know, wasn't super comfortable with negative emotions, but, but fear is a real emotion that we, you know, need to get comfortable with, um, especially, you know, in, in all things, but especially in business. Man, tell me more about leadership happy talk. I think that is something that so many leaders struggle with. That I think I've seen that everywhere. I've seen this, I see this, you see this all the time. What is leadership happy talk? Why does it exist? How can we help leaders overcome the feeling of being compelled to do leadership happy talk? Yeah, that's the question. I, I think it, it it's realizing um that when you protect your employees from the truth that you're patronizing them. You're treating them like children, kind of like Jack said, right. you, like, you don't, you're not really respecting them. Um, let's say, so if you're scared to say that, you know, we, we lost money last month. Um, that means that you think that your employees won't understand that, you know, we can lose money one month, but not for six, um, that they're too dumb to understand that. Um, but you see it, propagated in a lot of, you know, business culture, you know, the compliment sandwich, right? <laughs> so you, you start with a compliment in your review, and then you hit them with a criticism, and then you, you make them feel better with another compliment, like all of that kind of stuff is, it, it might be okay for, you know, I don't even do that with my four year old. Um, <laughs> I'm certainly not going to do it with an employee. Yeah, and, and Matt, what happens if you don't tell them and they find out, then they so I mean, when when they find out, that's when they struggle because yeah, trust they, is completely gone at that point. Exactly. Exactly. And it's going to be much worse in their mind if they found out through some other means than if it's just, yeah, you know, we lost oh, money this month, right? Right. Well, yeah, it's a really good point you bring up, Jack. I think a lot of times people fear the unknown versus the known. Like the unknown is so much more scary than known of like, hey, here's our situation. Best case scenario, we're at A. Medium case scenario, we're at B. Worst case scenario, we're at C. Most people, when it's unknown what A, B, and C are, the unknown outcome negatively is worse than C could ever possibly be. And so, yeah, being upfront and transparent about that is really critical, um, especially when pivots and iterations are, are being made. So I think what you're describing makes a ton of sense. Matt, earlier on in your... In, in in the answer to your first question, you talked about this concept of when change is made, being very clear of what the purpose of this change is. One thing that we often see is there's a ton of backlash when layoffs are made. And even in the most transparent and clear organizations, there's a ton of backlash because I think there are some people in the organization would think like, I am a bigger priority than this other department. You should slash them, not me, or vice versa. Why does that happen and how can we, I don't know, is there is there is there a way to make potentially laying people off or pivots um, that put people in different positions or out of the company? Is there a way to make that a better scenario for everyone involved? I, I think the the first, I mean, the first step of this is going, you know, upstream of it and trying to make better decisions that won't lead you to having to lay people off right so so not hiring too fast when things are too good and like all just moderating your strategy a little bit um but layoffs are always going to suck um and and i've found with you know larger ones or you know individual team you know individual person you know firings um being upfront and as honest as you can from the beginning i think is is the best thing that you can do. If if the rest of the organization understands the reason that those people aren't here anymore and they believe they're like, yeah, that was a good business decision, then they're going to be better. Um, I think a, a dangerous thing that a lot of people do is they'll say that a company is, is a family. You know, we're a family, we love each other. And then, you know, you fire your brother. <laughs> um, that, that doesn't really work. And and so being a little more straightforward about, yes, this is a business, we are for profit, and we're going to make decisions for that. Like, yes, we're going to take care of each other and be good to each other. But 
Um, this isn't for everybody. There will be times that we got to let people go. And, and I, I think it gets back to that just kind of foundational relationship that you have with your business overall. Yeah, and I, I think uh, when those decisions are made, it also has to come. Empathy is a thing. There are bis business decisions are business decisions. And, you know, when they are made, they have to be made. But I also think that if it is thought through well, people will take it better. Even the people that are affected. I mean, I've seen uh, organizations that really, you know, they've laid off people, but the people that were laid off, felt so much better because they didn't have to scramble with what am I going to do tomorrow because the organization took care of them where they were able to sustain themselves for the next six months, for the next eight months, because they, 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 they thought through it. Actually, those are organizations that think through it. But to your point, uh, Garrett, about, um, ab about hiring too fast when things are, are good, that's a big mistake organizations make. They think, oh, it's Christmas, let's do every hiring we can do and not thinking through the, the process of why are we even hiring these people? What's the long-term goal? And can we can we sustain this? Because sustainability and repeatability, repeatability is the thing that we should always think about. What is the long-term? And if we think about that, then we will be able to, even when we make that business decision, it will not be so impactful on people's lives in a negative way. That's what I mean. Like. Companies that think through these things, even when people are laid off, people feel much better because it's not it's not a thing of, okay, I, I don't know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow as an employee. So think through it in advance and and, and don't just make hurried decisions. And I, I want to add on one thing to that is, is that that's not just for big companies either. So I've seen really small startups, even if you can't afford to pay every the people that you're laying off for six months or a year, you can call your network, see who's hiring, you know, help them make some other connections and offer them and, and things like that too. Yeah. This is, you, Matt, you brought up such a great point about hiring too quickly. I think sometimes companies hire too quickly because they see an opportunity and they want to strike, strike while the iron's hot. And the fear is that if we don't strike while the iron's hot, we might not capitalize on an opportunity to up level and get ourselves in the next level. But the risk is that if it's a flash in the pan and the pan is already flashed and now we're stuck with all these extra people, there could be issues. But I think a more critical element within all this is success metrics and not having clear success metrics. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, when layoffs happen, People did everything they were asked to do and still got laid off, which means that the leadership did not do a good enough job of laying out like these are clear success metrics. This is what you need to do to be successful. So I guess how can leaders go about more effectively setting good success metrics? So then if people do get laid off, they know why. They're like, hey, I didn't hit my numbers. I was supposed to be able to do this. I unfortunately wasn't able to deliver I get it. There's ideally little confusion or surprise if a layoff occurs because there were clear success metrics in place. How, how can leaders go about more effectively setting those success metrics? I'll jump in here and being, you know, for most of my career in the sales and business development side, I will tell you that I've been measured by metrics that I felt were you know, not tied to the most obvious metric for a salesperson should be revenue, revenue growth, margin growth, you know, um, and there's just such a clear and direct, at the end of the quarter, you see your total numbers and you can look back and say, you know, whatever I was doing, hopefully it's more intentional than that, but whatever I was doing, it worked this quarter or it didn't work this quarter. Um, so I think you just need to be very intentional as a leader about what are you measuring in each functional group? You know, is it truly the most, you know, the North Star metric, as they say, um, and then sticking to that, obviously, go through tough times, you have to do layoffs, there are times as a leader, like, you're going to have to let go of good people that you know, maybe were doing a good job, there's some extraneous circumstance, Christine, you brought up COVID earlier, um, you know, especially in the education system, obviously, that for a lot of businesses, that was a, a huge change. Um, but extraneous situations aside, normal operations, if you're measuring the things that matter and there's a direct correlation between that person's skill set, depending on their function, what metric it's tied to, 
um, and you're communicating throughout that process, like, hey, this is behind, what's going on, and not just surprising them with, uh, you know, a pink slip or them finding out they're getting laid off, as long as they know throughout the process. As far as defining the metric, like I said, as a salesperson, it's easy for me to say, yeah, revenue should matter. Um, I think it gets a little bit more difficult for um, different functions, maybe, but I can only talk to my experience and, and my um, little world that I operate in. Yeah, I, I'm going to add to Jack, uh, while we are on that point of success metrics, one thing I'm going to say is that leaders have to think about the whole, the big picture. Because you, Jack, when you are, you are the sales leader, you're making sure that your salespeople are doing their job, which is to sell. But there's another team that is going to be implementing what you have sold. So you could sell it, but if the implementation is not done well, the customer is still not happy. And therefore, did you really get your job done? Probably not, because your job depends. So dependability, what are, we, what are the dependencies? So your department depends on also good implementation of the next team that you hand over to after you do the sale. So if we are, we are talking of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, an assessment platform, for example, and you've already sold it to an organization. So the implementers, the people that are going to make sure that it's implemented while you turn it over and go find another sale. So it is a puzzle. It's not one thing. So I'm, I'm saying this to say, as leaders think about this, they have to think about the whole puzzle from the sale to close and to repeat. Mm -hmm. How do we, how are we making sure that all the gaps are closed, that there's no gap anywhere because the sales team could do their job well but the other teams that it's been, been, being passed to are not doing their job well. So it's a whole big picture that we have to think about, not just one team or not to just one function. That, yeah. That's a really good point as well. Sorry to jump in here, Matt. Um, but as the salesperson, right, you can, oh, revenue, 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 new deals, new deals, new deals. But you can get into where you're tracking metrics and having people drive to things that potentially throw the company out of balance. I mean, I've lived through supply chain issues in the building materials world where we outsold our production capacity and then all of our customers were upset about us, you know, extending lead times, this, that, and the other. So, you know, in a perfect world, it would be great if everybody has that holistic picture of, yeah, this is our production capacity, so let's not go beyond that in this product category. Um, but it's extremely difficult. But I think something definitely to keep in mind is let's make sure our goals are not competing against one another somehow. Um, and that we can have that real-time feedback. If you are a multi-product company, you know, sales are going great, but we're over-focused on this one product. We need to diversify a little bit and also let the factory get a little bit of a break over here, sell some other products. Uh, so yeah, definitely great comment, Christine. Yeah, I think it really, it really, really depends on what your business is. Like, like hard and fast metrics per person make great sense if you're, you know, in a factory, um, and and things like that. But especially in software, especially in in the more knowledge worky kind of places, like I'm generally anti metric for judging people. Like, I think metrics are great for judging the business overall and seeing how you know the overall machine is is working, and you can tweak and, and use that for information on your decisions. But um, I've yet to see, you know, metrics on an individual basis that really reflected how the person did um, in those types of environments. That's awesome. This has been a really good conversation. Last question I like to ask, and this is the question that I always like to ask everybody I bring on our pre-symposium panels, is what is a popular belief about leadership that you disagree with? And so when I say popular, I mean, over you would think that over 50% of other leaders would believe in this, but you disagree with it. What's a popular belief about leadership that you disagree with? That that leaders should be consistent. Um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit. I, I think I think that this idea that a leader should be consistent um and not surprise their people ever um and things like that leads to things like happy talk, leads to things like suppressing, you know, negative news, negative emotions, all those sorts of things. Um, and, and it also kind of pins people into a place where 
they aren't comfortable being themselves. Um, so if, you know, my boss, you know, which is your, you know, de facto role model, um, never shows any emotion is kind of robotic, you know, super consistent every day. Like if that's who you are, cool, then, then that's fine. But I think a lot of, especially younger leaders try to manufacture that because they think that they need to be stoic and tough and, and the rock for everybody. And I know some of the most meaningful times that I've interactions that I've had with bosses were when they opened up and were like, Hey, I'm not sure about this. Or like, I don't feel like doing stuff today. And just like acknowledging those human things. Um, I think that can go a, a long way for the relationship with people. I like that. I think that makes tons of sense. I, I would say that most leaders think that they should be consistent and, and be stoic and have this nine shining armor on and never have any vulnerabilities or cracks on the armor. But in reality, that's not human. And people go through challenges and phases of, of life. And I, I think what you're describing makes tons of sense, Matt. That's a, that's a really good one. Jack, Christine, what's a popular belief about leadership that you disagree with? Well, that they know everything. I mean, I've, I've seen, um, uh, as, you know, many situations where people, if people come to you and they ask you something that you don't know, they feel like, so who knows it? Like, who, who's going to do this? I mean, if you don't know, what am I supposed to do? Now, that's a missed opportunity for many people for, first of all, collaboration. That is the time for me to say, hey, I, I don't really know how to do this, but we can figure it out together. So that gives me the ability to actually bring you on board so we can think through it. and also makes me vulnerable because it's 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 okay to be vulnerable it's okay to say that you don't know something it's okay not to know something because just because you're a leader does not mean and 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 and, and truth be told uh garrett as a ceo if you knew everything you wouldn't need your hr person if you knew everything you wouldn't need your marketing person so you don't know everything, but there's that belief that because you're the CEO, because you're the leader, because you're this, you should know everything. So I disagree that leaders don't have to know everything. Mm, I love it. And that flies right in the face of what a lot of, well, it, I, I think most leaders would, would agree with that statement, but they don't act that way. And so one thing that I observe is that objectivity diminishes the higher anyone goes in any organizational hierarchy. What I mean by that is just human nature. We respect our boss enough that we are much less likely to challenge their way of thinking. And so as leaders, it's easy to have an opinion. I can be an armchair expert about anything and say, you know what? I think this look on the website should from the logo should go from here and we should put it over here because, you know, I don't know. I think it's got better feng shui that way. But I don't know exactly what code needs to go into that. I don't know how frustrating it is for my developer to then go ahead and make that happen. And does this now go to priority one? Like, where does that go? And and I think, I think I don't know, Christine, to add to your point, not only do leaders not know everything, but they need to have the self-awareness to recognize when they're not an expert in a space and shut their mouth because like they should recognize that once you open it and say any opinion about anything, that even if you're not expert on, everybody else is going to ripple around it and co, 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 I think coalesce is the word I'm looking for. They're going to follow whatever you're going to say. Um, so, I, yeah, I like that, Christine. I think that makes sense. Jack, how about you? What's a popular belief about leadership you disagree with? Um, I see a lot of stuff in you know, articles, books about the importance of acting fairly, treating the team fairly, leading fairly. Um, and again, I think this will kind of come back to my, the majority of my experience being in sales, but even in the supply chain world and, you know, capital project construction, uh, managing a team and you get a very high visibility project and you need to assign it to someone or in the sales world, you get an inbound lead that's a big company, could be a lot of revenue and a lot of commission for someone. And you're looking at your team and going, well, well this person's kind of struggling, but yeah, they miss a lot of days. I've worked in both remote and on-site environments. And in the remote world, I found you know, attendance became very um, unreliable sometimes for some of your lower players and always felt an internal struggle about that where I felt as though I was playing God a little bit, especially in the sales roles when you're like truly affecting people's um, annual earnings, their commission. But at the end of the day, when you come into a hard situation like that, especially where there's a time crunch to it, someone pops into a Zoom room and you've got to 
jump in and give them a demo if you're in software sales, but you need a partner um, off of your sales team to come with you. Yeah. Who are you going to call first? The person that you can rely on, the person that you know is going to be there through the follow-up and is not going to drop the ball. And when there is that time crunch, the whole prospect of fairness just goes out of the window. So I always think it's a bit trite when I read this, like, treat everyone fairly, spread the opportunity, blah, 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 blah. And I think it is a little bit leadership happy talk we've used on this call a few times. Um, you know, when you're faced with the time, I'm a big believer in Pareto efficiency. Like you probably get 80% of your performance out of your top 20%. You know, if it works for which branches on an apple tree produce the most fruit, like I certainly think it, it shows up in other areas of life. And when you are in that time crunch, you're going to go to who you can rely on. Those are going to be the people that you want to advance with you through the organization. Um, and, you know, having been in situations where you're managing a team that you didn't necessarily hire or um, being in a team that you built yourself and you hired everyone, I'd like to think that I could hire the 10 perfect people for my 10 person team. But even in those situations, I've found that you wind up just having your two or three people that you know you can always rely on. And do they get a disproportionate amount of the opportunity? Absolutely. Um, and then kind of a last comment on this, especially in the sales world, it is opportunity. I think where it gets challenging is in more operational functions, the supply chain role. If I'm just dishing out contracts to one purchasing person to always handle because they're my reliable person, they're getting paid the end of the year, the same amount as the person next to them that's not getting those contract opportunities or those project opportunities. And there, I think it's very challenging to manage because you know, your best employees doing most of the work and other people are sitting around and they're maybe not getting rewarded for it. Maybe that's out of your control, especially in a larger organization. You have no, no real say on what their annual raise is gonna be or any performance bonus. It's decided a level, at a level higher than you um, but within sales, and you know, part of why I like sales so much is because there is that direct correlation. And when you're giving those opportunities out, uh, you know, you don't have to feel guilty about putting work on someone's plate. You're putting opportunity on their plate and going back to the people that you can trust and rely on. Well, I'm going to paraphrase that. Um, yeah. <laughs> essentially, my paraphrase version of what you said was fairness is overrated when it comes to performing well. And also... We are not the best judges of people in an interview. Yeah. And so that sometimes we have a sunk cost fallacy when we have made a bad hire, but because we made that hire, we stick with them longer because we made the hire and we've got a sense of hubris about our hiring abilities. So I think that what you say, Jack, makes a ton of sense. And uh, I think in an ideal environment where we can make the most optimal hire all the time, 100% fairness makes tons of sense. But that's not always the case. To your point, Pareto's principle, 20% of our people are our best performers, and we're going to send them the lion's share of the big opportunities because they we know they're going to get that. We're either going to get us the best chance to close that deal. Yeah. Cool. Well, Jack, Matt, Christine, thanks for being here. This was an excellent pre-symposium panel. For everybody watching this, if you are interested in meeting these three incredible leaders and attending our upcoming executive symposium on leading adoption in a change environment, Please feel free to click the link to RSVP in the chat. Um, we'd love to see you there October 26th in Houston. We'll be finalizing the venue within the next week. So I'll be making an announcement where the venue will be um, within the next week. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Garrett.